All righty. I am pleased to be joined by Matt Eisenberg of RushTheCourt.net. How's it going, Matt? I'm doing great. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Again, thanks for coming on on kind of a short notice. Um, of course, right now it's the uh, NCAA tournament or just March Madness, probably one of the best times of all in sports. Um, but before we talk about the NCAA tournament, stuff like that, do you want to introduce yourself, talk more about Rush the Court, stuff like that? So, yeah, I'm Matt Eisenberg, work with RushTheCourt.net. Uh, I've been doing it now for a couple seasons. This past season uh, has been a joy to have fans back in college basketball. Mm -hmm. It's made things much more exciting. The pageantry is back. The atmosphere at March Madness at the tournament sites has been it's been off the charts again. So it's been a fun college basketball season, and I'm, and I'm happy to be here to uh, talk about it. All right, again, thanks for coming on. Again, I think I interviewed your partner last year, and that was a great talk. Um, and again, you can check out all the, all, all of his links to Rush the Court, of course, his Twitter account as well, all that in the description down below. All right, let's get into the um, – let's ta talk about March Madness to start off. So um, there was a lot of upsets in the first week. Were you really surprised by all the uh, upsets that happened? I think it, it depends uh, – it depends where we go with it. Um it's March Madness. It's the NCAA tournament. There's going to be upsets. Um, but if you told me a week ago that, what, St. Peter's would be sitting in the Sweet 16 mm -hmm. after knocking off Kentucky and Murray State, I would have said, you're crazy. Uh, here we are with, what, Miami and, and Iowa State in the Sweet mm -hmm. 16. I, I don't think anyone saw that coming. Uh, you knew, you knew st funny stuff was going to happen. You just never quite know – where it's going to come from. And, and I think that's the beauty of, of this tournament. Yeah. And I guess this wasn't necessarily a, a super upset, but they were a top seed Baylor, of course, um, fell to North Carolina. And of course, North Carolina is, you know, one of, a, a, it's a blue blood, but I was a little surprised there. Um, how do you think Baylor was able to, or not Baylor? How do you think North Carolina was able to take down Baylor on Saturday? Well, with a bit of luck after blowing that 25 point lead, mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think it just came down to the injuries caught up to Baylor. Uh, Jonathan JTT, as we're going to call him, and uh, LJ Cryer. There just wasn't enough offense in Baylor. Kind of smoke and mirrors the way James Akinjo was playing down the, down the stretch. And, and North Carolina, the, the spark that they got in that win to close the season at Duke. Mm -hmm. it's, there's just been an energy in, in the program really ever since they lost at home to Pitt. And there was talk about is Hubert Davis the right right guy to lead to lead the team? They they put it together, and here they are uh, playing as well as anyone. Do you think they can actually make a run to the Final Four this year? I'm a Barone fan at heart, so my my I want to say no, um, but I think they're a tough matchup, uh, both mm -hmm. for UCLA and potentially for Purdue. You have a big in Armando Baycott and Brady Manick who can give anyone trouble. The guards are playing well. They still, it's, it's going to be tough to beat UCLA, uh, but but if they do, yeah, I think they can get by by a Purdue team. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they made it either, but um, it just is crazy how they beat Baylor and, <clears throat> excuse me, basically all the number one seeds had problems. You know, um, Gonzaga almost lost to Memphis. You know, Arizona had to beat TCU in overtime. Um, you know, Kansas had some troubles as well. Um, I actually put this on a, on a poll question, but do you, who, um, what number one seed do you think has the best chance to actually lose this upcoming week? The best chance to lose is a number one seed this week. Um, I think if, if I said in the Sweet 16, it's Arizona uh, mm -hmm. because of the matchup against Houston. If, you, if I took the whole weekend as a whole, it might be Gonzaga because of the Elite Eight matchup against either Texas Tech or Duke. Uh, but the way Arizona got by TCU, razor thin margin there. The way Houston plays defense, and and the way they really played off, play offense of late, guard play, you can get it. An injured Kirk Creesa take advantage of that. I I think Houston really could give Arizona troubles uh, in, in the Sweet Sixteen. Well, uh, speaking of Arizona, they really they I thought they were going to lose that game against TCU on Sunday night. How do you think they were able to come back? And of course, their defense got really good at the end there. But how do you think Arizona was able to come back and take down TCU on Sunday night? There were a few things that seemed to go their way. The first was after timeouts, they were getting really good luck. So so whatever Tommy Lloyd was drawing up on the sideline, it 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 made its way onto the court in, into the form of baskets. And, and it helps when you have Pac-12 player of the year, Benedict Matherin, 
going back door and then making that three in the final 30 seconds to, to tie it up. Um, you need big time players to make big time plays. And that's kind of what it took for Arizona. And then we can debate whether there was a foul or not a foul uh, on TCU's final possession uh, that maybe helped Arizona a little bit, but to be able to make those plays and then to refocus after overtime or, or after the end of regulation, heading into overtime after such a big play and nearly winning it in regulation, I, I think it's a testament to what Tommy Lloyd is building there in Arizona. Yeah, and it's it was pretty incredible for Arizona win. Of course, my bracket's pretty much busted, but you know I was kind of rooting for Arizona to win that game. Um, and speaking of, well, not a lot of people are talking about it as of much, but how do you think the refing has been this? Uh, how do you think the refing was the first week of March Madness? It wasn't good. Uh, the play to me that still stands out is the technical foul in the um, Illinois Houston game hanging on the rim, uh, which just made no sense. We, we've seen it. The, the block and the charge call all season long is there's too many charges. And then near the end of Texas, Purdue, Jay Nivey ran down the court, made a pass to a, to a kicked out for a three that, that went in, but a charge was overlooked. So it's just inconsistent. Uh, mm-hmm. The TCU Arizona ending. I, I think the inconsistency is the problem. Um, some games they let they let players play it out. Other games they they don't call anything. The final ten minutes of Purdue and North Carolina after the I think questionable ejection of Brady Manick turned into a foul fest, and, and Baylor was living at the line. Uh, something along the lines of Purdue shot sixty free throws in two games, even with their big men. It's been like a plus forty advantage to them. It's 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 hard to figure out what you're going to get with college referees, and I, I think that's one of the biggest complaints with this sport. Yeah, and I think you can say that about the last few years for the NCA, where the you know the refs aren't great. Almost in every sport, there's always a problem, but yeah, the refing has never been a strong point for college basketball. But you know, hopefully, it gets fixed. Not sure, but hopefully, it does. Um, how about uh, let's start? Let's actually. Um, Let's actually shift gears right now and um, from the NCAA tournament. To, we'll talk about college basketball, but let's just shift gears from the tournament for just a bit. Um, Xavier just brought back Sean Miller. Um, were you surprised by that hire, and how well do you think he'll do um, coming back to Xavier? I think Sean Miller is the perfect fit there. Uh, obviously, having coached there, there's not going to be quite the pressure that he, he had at Arizona. Uh, At Arizona, the expectations are that you're going to be the premier school out west with UCLA and and Gonzaga. Uh, And there was lots of regular season success. There was tournament success early on. It just never manifested itself near the end. And and then the outside distractions, the FBI situation, Mm -hmm. it it tarnished things. But now you go back to the Big East. He he didn't coach the Big East with Xavier the first time around. It was the A-10. Um, but here's a guy that won consistently at Xavier. It was 27 wins his final year, 30 wins the year before, 25 before that. A, a Pittsburgh guy. I, I think he's the ideal fit for, for a Xavier team. In, in a Big East, frankly, that you have Villanova, you have UConn. Uh, Providence is up and coming with Ed Cooley. But after that, there, there's a spot for Xavier near the top of the Big East on, on a regular basis. Yeah, I was a little surprised with the move, but I mean, you know, Xavier's been pretty good except for the last few years, but they're normally a basketball school. Even with Chris Mack, they were solid. Um, Speaking of Chris Mack, he's no longer at Louisville. Um, And being a Louisville fan, I was actually really excited by this hire, but Louisville recently hired Kenny Payne. I think he'll do excellent. It seems like he's a great recruiter. Um, How well do you think he'll do in his first year with Louisville? And do you think that was a good hire? I think it was a really good hire. I I think it was the right hire. Uh, There was talk of... Mm -hmm other names, but I, I think P- Payne was the one that made the most sense. It, it was a team that was 10 and four, four and zero to start ACC play this year. I, it's going to be difficult with, again, outside noise. It's going to be surrounding the program. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but there's no reason that there's no excuse for Louisville to be what they were this year, next year, 13 and 19, what losing 12 of their last 14, something along those lines. They're better than that. And I expect Kenny Payne to have a, a good first year in Louisville. And uh, what do you think is next for Chris Mack? You know, he was at Xavier before and out, and then he was at Louisville. Do you think he'll be coaching again somewhere? And where do you think that best place would be? I can't see Chris Mack coaching this upcoming season. Mm -hmm. Um, With the exception, 
possible exception. Uh, he was out tweeting happy for Sean Miller. Is there any chance he becomes Sean Miller's top assistant back at, back at, back at Xavier? Uh, I, I'd be surprised if that were to happen, but I'm not going to say there's a 0% chance of that happening. Um, but but Matt, between all that Mac and, and Miller have been dealing with, again, outside of on the court situations, it, it'd be a pairing that I, I just don't think could happen, but crazier things have happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what happens with Chris Mack. And he didn't do a bad job at Louisville. He did make the tournament in his first year, but that was really the only tournament they made. And, of course, they haven't won a tournament game since, I think, 2017. So, yeah, Kenny Payne has a big um, – um, definitely he's got, he's got a lot of work to do, but I think he can be, I think he's a great coach. He's, he's a good recruiter. I think he's going to do a great job with, um, for as coach of the Cardinals. Um, another coach too, that got fired, you know, this was a few weeks ago, but Tom Crean is no longer at Georgia. Um, what do you think is next for Georgia? And do you think Crean ever gets another ch- chance to coach in college basketball? <sighs> From Indiana to Georgia and his time at Georgia was a flat out disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, I think his next job, if Tom Cream were to get one, is outside the power conference. Um, do I think he gets another job soon? Probably not. His time at Georgia, again, a, a disaster doesn't doesn't do it justice. Um, Georgia never got better. You saw players leave left and right this past season. Key players. Uh, that made contributions elsewhere. I, I, I don't see him. I don't see Tom Crean being a name that many ads are going to go out and go out on the line and, and trust to hire. So no, I, I Tom Crean's time at a major program it, it's it's in the past. Yeah, I, I think you're right as well. And um, we'll see what happens with Crean. But um, I mean, do you think Chris Mack has a better chance of getting a job before Crean? Yeah, because I think as you pointed out that Louisville wasn't bad under under chris Mm -hmm. mack uh it it was the dino gaudio uh stuff came about and then mack lost the locker room and once he lost the locker room i I think disaster snowballed on him quicker than he could ever imagine but he at least won Uh, Mm -hmm. tom crean didn't win at all at georgia so i i think max positioned much more favorably than uh tom crean yeah, you know, that makes sense. Um, let's go back to the NCAA tournament. Um, what is one game that you're looking to or you're looking forward to in the Sweet 16 on Thursday and Friday? Or what game is intrigues you the most? I think the one that intrigues me the most might not be the one that jumps off the paper, but 10 seed Miami against 11 seed Iowa State. Uh, a team, one of these teams is obviously going to be a, a win away from the Final Four. The way Miami dismantled Auburn in, in the round of uh, 32 game really caught my eye. It's a Miami team that has seven turnovers through two games in the tournament while forcing 31. Uh, you have an Iowa State team that held LSU to 54 points, Wisconsin 49 points. Um, the guard play of Miami and uh, Isaiah Wong, Charlie Moore, Cam McGusty against the transfer brigade of uh, an Iowa State team that, again, was 2-22 and last year. To be where they are right now, I think, is a miracle. Uh, so, so to have one of these teams be a win away from the Elite Eight, it's a game I'm, I'm going to be fascinated by. Yeah, you know, you just talked about Iowa State's emergence and yeah, going two and twenty-two or two or yeah, two and twenty-two from a year ago from going all the way to the Sweet Sixteen. That's quite a transformation. And yeah, that would be interesting to see if Iowa State can go far. Um, do you have an early championship prediction or who do you think is the or right now, who do you think would be the two teams playing in um, the championship game this year? So I'm gonna stick with my pre tournament prediction of Gonzaga over Arizona. Um I don't know if it's the safest pick again. Gonzaga's road in the Elite Eight scares me. Uh, Arizona, the way they played last Sunday and and the matchup against Houston worries me a little bit. But I think they're the two best teams. Um, We we saw in the second half against Memphis, Gonzaga's firepower, the reliability of Drew Timmy. Uh, You throw the ball to Timmy and good things happen. Either he's going to get you a basket or he's going to find find a guy wide open for three or or throw a lob to uh, to Chet. Arizona, even when up against the pressure, even when Kirk creases one of ten from three, they can still find a way to get it done. Um, You have Ben Matherin who's playing out of his mind right now. 
they're still to me the, the two best teams in this. Yeah, and I think before the tournament, I uh, before like the before the tournament started, I think I had Gonzaga going, uh, winning it all, or winning it at least, getting into the championship game in New Orleans. But Gonzaga, the last few years, they've been really good. They haven't been able to get that championship. But let's first talk about their game against uh, Memphis. The first half, they didn't play great. Um, there was a few fouls that I didn't really agree with, but you know, Gonzaga was able to get through it. Do you think most of that was the leadership and um, just the emergence of Drew Timmy? Yeah. Um, the way he's a, the way he's able to score in the post, his footwork. I, I can't even remember the last player that 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 does it as well as he does. He really put the team on the back. Now, I'm concerned the fa- about the fact that they're shooting 54 percent from the free throw line. Mm-hmm. I'm concerned that the team, other than Andrew Nembhard, is nine of 30 from three. Shet one of 14 from three his last five games. That's a problem. But having played both Duke and Texas Tech already this season, I think it maybe gives them a leg up a little bit. One, we saw them almost at their worst against Duke. 17 turnovers. Duke Duke had twenty. Duke won the points off turn, turnover battle 23-2. to two, And it was still a three-point game. Uh, so mm-hmm. we saw Gonzaga not play well and still give Duke all they could handle. We saw them beat Texas Tech rather easily. Texas Tech didn't have Terrence Shannon, but still Drew Timmy had seven points. Chet had five and they still won by 14. Um, As you mentioned, just the ability to, to, to to ride Drew Timmy. It's something no other team has a a reliable presence in the post to the same level. Yeah. And especially if Drew Timmy can play like that, like he did on uh, Saturday, I think Gonzaga is going to be hard to stop. Now, um, I would love to see Gonzaga finally win that championship because last year they were so close and then got blown up by Baylor. They were close in 2017, got beat by North Carolina. But I would like to see Gonzaga win it. But, you know, we'll see what happens. There's still a lot left to be played. Um, I think let's actually let's continue talking about, you know, actually let's let's get off the NCAA tournament just a bit. Do you have a prediction for college basketball player of the year or do you have a few guys you have in, um or you're thinking about that should win the college basketball player of the year? It's going to be hard pressed, I think, for Oscar Sheepway not to win it. Um, what he did at Kentucky this year, both offensively in terms of scoring, and then his rebounding levels, Tim Duncan esque uh, stuff we didn't see ever recent in recent times. Tw- the number of twenty rebound games, uh, it's going to be hard pressed, I think, to to ignore that. Um, there are going to be the, the Big Ten players that had big years prior to the NCAA tournament, I think it's going to be hard to ignore a Johnny Davis or a Keegan Murray to Iowa. But I just don't think they, they can live up to what Oscar Sheboy did, did this year at Kentucky. Uh, so, so he, he'd be the guy that I think walks away with this. Yeah. And speaking of Kentucky and of course they get beaten the first round and as you all know that can, you know, Kentucky is one of the biggest blue bloods in college basketball and they've been able to get the best recruity or recruits and they're always the top team. But yet since two or for the last what 20 years, they've won one championship. Why do you think that is? And do you think Kentucky can finally win that second championship? And just why do you think Kentucky's only been able to win one championship? I think the, the, it begins with the fact that it's it's hard to win the NCAA tournament. We, we've mm-hmm. seen this with whether it be Gonzaga or it took Jay Wright a while to win one at Villanova. Mm-hmm. Coach K's gone through withdrawals at, at times. It, it, it's it's hard to win. Um, it, for a while, it was hard with with uh, Coach Calipari turning over the roster year after year. Uh, you bring in five McDonald's All Americans, three of them turn into All Americans, uh, but then they leave, and, and you're stuck doing it all year after year. And while he's had a a very high rate of success with that for a long period of of time, um, it's still hard to build a championship level roster doing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, More recently, I think he's been leaning into the transfer portal. Uh, There was the year with the Reed Travis from Stanford. Didn't quite work out to the level uh, he had hoped. There was Olivier Saar from Wake Forest, I I believe was the number one transfer recruit on, on the, on the market uh, didn't work out. It, it did with Oscar. Uh, and it, and frankly, it worked out with Kellen Grady from, uh, from Davidson this year. It, it just didn't work out in the end. Uh, 
losing the, losing to St. Peter's is going to be a hard pill to swallow. And, and you can say, well, at the end of the day, you have to make shots, and they were four or fifteen from three. And, and if you go four mm-hmm. or fifteen from three, and the other team shoots fifty two percent from three, you're not going to win. Um, so is it roster construction? Is it is it bad luck? Uh, Severe Wheeler, another good transfer from Georgia. He had, he had successful freshman years from Ty Ty Washington. It, it you don't want to say it, it falls back on a Calipari in game coaching, but but there are some of those out there that that want to suggest that that's an issue, and and that plays a role into why Kentucky can't get it get it done. But twenty six and eight uh, near the top of the SEC all season long. We saw what they did at Kansas uh, a couple months ago. It was a good good basketball team. Things just uh, didn't didn't fall their way here in March. Yeah, it's interesting too because I think every every few years <clears throat> it seemed like Duke would get upset by a certain team, but losing to St. Peter's and of course St. Peter's is now in the Sweet Sixteen, so that looks a little bit big, a little better. But yeah, as you mentioned, that's going to really hurt Kentucky. But you know, we'll see. You know what happens next year, and of course they're going to get better recruits. And I'm just, I can't think of the recruits that they're getting in next year, but I'm assuming they're in the top three. So. Um, and talk, uh, speaking of St. Peter's, um, they're at the Sweet 16. Do you think, and this would be a long shot, but do you think there's a good chance or any chance for them of actually making it to the Final Four and being one of the low, lowest seeds ever to make it? Again, to be where they are, it's already remarkable, so I don't want to say they have no chance. But... To to be, I mean, to start start with this round to to beat a Purdue team that has the two headed monster of Trevion Williams and Zach Eady in the middle, that has an NBA top ten pick in Jaden Ivey on the wing, that's loaded with three point shooters. That do I think St. Peter's can beat them? No. But Purdue's a a team that defensively falls asleep. They haven't been shooting the ball very well here in the tournament. Um. If if St. Peter's starts knocking down threes, can they make it a game? Yeah, but they're going to be they're going to be really hard pressed to to stop or to slow Edie and Williams and or to stay out of foul trouble. And, and I just don't know how they do it. And even if they then get by Purdue, you have to do it again against either a UCLA team that's as efficient as there is in the country, uh, that's experienced, or a North Carolina team that's now going to have gone through Baylor and UCLA playing really well and again that has loads of size i'm with you i'd love to see it i I just don't see how st peter's can muscle out two more wins uh here here this late in the tournament yeah i mean i agree with you it'd be a great story but yeah it's (laughs) it would be a long shot um i can't think of st peter's as coach for some reason i i had, had it this morning but now i can't think of it do you think there's um, – so if he has another good year like this, like this year on – or okay, so next year if he has a good year like this year, do you think there's a chance for him to move on to a big-time school? Well, I, I think we're going to even see that sooner. Um, I think all the talk is with Kevin Willard having moved on from um, – oh, my God, goodness, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking – Seton Hall. Shaking all, Holloway, a Seton Hall alum, I, I think you have – his job waiting for him in a couple of weeks or rather in a couple of days uh, after this thing, after their run ends, I I think it would be a surprise not to see him move on sooner rather than later. Yeah, it would make sense. We saw that the same thing with uh, Florida Gulf coast way back in 2013. And I can't think of the coach's name either, but he went on to USC after having that long run after going all the way to sweet 16. So yeah, I mean, I would not be surprised as well if he decided to leave St. Peter's and, onto the uh onto a much like a much you know a, a better or not a better place but or yeah pretty much a better place so um let's start talking about more of the upsets before we end the show and again thanks for coming on um we look at the first uh really the first big upset richmond took down iowa and i'm from iowa so a lot of times iowa usually when they make it to the tournament they only get to the first or second round but um what did you think of that game overall so I fell into the trap of Iowa, like so many. The, the way they played in the Big Ten tournament, uh, with the firepower, the experience, I, I had Iowa in the Final Four. Uh, I, I, was a, I was a believer this year in the Hawkeyes. For them to come out and fall apart both offensively and defensively the way they did, Jordan Bohannon's six points, 
uh, as a team shoots six of 29 from three. Richmond experienced team, a dangerous team, especially the way they had just gone through the A-10 tournament. But still, uh, it, it was very, very surprising. Um, the way they – they just fell apart. There really is no other way to say it. Iowa played one of its worst games of the, the, worst games of the season at the absolute wrong time. Yeah, and it seems like Iowa – they usually shock a lot of people at times, but this year, of course, made that big run, won the Big Ten. Um, I had them at least going to the Sweet 16, and not a lot of people are talking about this, but what do you think about the future of Fran McCaffrey? Do you think he's going to stay at Iowa for a few more years? And Iowa has a tendency of keeping their coaches for a very long time, um, but what do you think about the future of Fran McCaffrey at, at Iowa? I think he's, as long as he's happy there, I, I don't see him moving on. Um mm-hmm. If you're Iowa, it's one of those situations. I think you have to be careful about thinking of what what you are as a program Mm -hmm. in the Big Ten. You're never going to be maybe a Wisconsin or a Michigan State, a Michigan and Ohio State. To me, you're you're that tier right below those schools. Uh, To get rid of a coach that has now had a, a player of the year last year in Luca Garza, a candidate this year in Keegan Murray, you have one, you routinely have one of the nation's best offenses. You're winning 20 games regularly. You're, you're finishing above 500 on a routine basis in the Big Ten. I wouldn't be pushing Fran McCaffrey out. Now, as you pointed out, are the, the NC, early NCAA exits too routine? Probably. Fran has been yet to reach a Sweet 16 at Iowa. Uh and this is as a five seed, a two seed, a ten seed, a seven seed, a seven seed, and an eleven seed. So more recently, but not getting any tournament wins these last two years beyond or beyond the first round last year. Uh, it, it's alarming, but again, if Fran's happy, I think as a program, Iowa needs to be happy because if you you let go of him, you don't know what's coming, and, and I don't think it's going to be better. Yeah, and you just mentioned, yeah, you don't want to rush, you know, McCaffrey. And I think they did the same thing with Tom Davis years ago, and they brought in, I can't think of his name right now, but he was at UCLA for a while. He struggled. Uh, Steve Offord, I think it was. Steve they Alford, brought him yeah. in, and he just did not did not last very long there. So you do bring up a good point there. So um, I can't, um, as you mentioned, Iowa had that big run. They won the Big Ten tournament. A team that was completely opposite was Michigan. And now all of a sudden they're in the Sweet 16. They got hot at the right time, I guess. Um, I mean, what did what did you think about Michigan's run? I mean, I'm I'm just surprised they're in because I'm, I'm even surprised they're in the Sweet 16. But what are your thoughts on the Wolverines? The way they got in, uh, what then starting the tournament trailing a good Colorado State team by 15 points, mm-hmm. uh, got by a, a Tennessee team, SEC tournament champions that that had been had one of the most impressive first round wins. The way they uh, handled their first round opponent to come back and win there, to do it without Devontae Jones in the second half of that game, uh, the young Frankie Collins playing, playing point guard there. But it's one of these, when you have a star player, and, and maybe we, as a sport, Hunter Dickinson in some ways was overshadowed this year in the Big Ten. You, you had all this attention on Kofi, on EJ Liddell, on Keegan Murray, on Johnny Davis. And here, Hunter Dickinson, is he's averaging over 20 points a game since the start of February. Uh, he was a second-team All-American last year. Uh, a, a player that's really hard to guard. And now more recently, the, the play of Eli Brooks has stepped up. It is surprising. Uh, and then, of course, the Jawan Howard situation down the, down the stretch of the regular season. But when you have a, a big man, a mismatch, someone that can just take over a game like Hunter Dickinson, um, while it's surprising, may, maybe it's something that we shouldn't be shocked by, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting too. And I just you know, if Michigan can make it all the way to the Final Four, that will be that'll be quite a run. But um, I know we're going a little long here. But what do you think about Jawan Howard? If he has another successful year at Michigan, do you think he would actually jump to the NBA? I think that's that would be the only thing that would get him out of Michigan would be an NBA job. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know the situation of his sons are playing for him at Michigan. I, I forget if there's another one on the way or if they're just young, young on the team. Um, 
That's a good question. Does an NBA does an NBA team shy away from from the sideline uh, altercation uh, with Greg Gard late in the year, and, and a year ago with Mark Turgeon during during a timeout? Um, is there immediate baggage with Juwan? Perhaps, but but I I, I think you're right that long term, I would not be surprised if Juwan Howard is eyeing a, a job on an NBA sideline. Yeah, because we all saw the previous Michigan coach. Um, I think it was John. Was it John Beeline? I think it was John Beeline. I can't yeah. really quite remember, but he made the switch to the Cavs um, in the NBA, and he was less. He was there for like six months, and that was it. So, but I wouldn't be surprised. And yeah, he's been in the NBA. So I, I just thought it was interesting. I think before, I think I started talking about last year, but it would be interesting to see if Jawan Howard, because there's going to be a few openings in the NBA. There already are. I mean, even the Lakers job could be open too. So that would be interesting. But. Um, yeah, it does. It's very interesting to see what would happen to Howard. And and before we end the show, or, and again, thanks for coming on, Matt. Um, is there another upset that we haven't talked about that you were, you were really intrigued with, or is there another one we forgot to talk about? Uh, the most other upsets that caught my eye early on, we talked Richmond, we talked Iowa State. Uh, again, the Miami, what Miami has done, I think has, has been obviously um, noteworthy. St. Peter's. Uh, I guess the one other that that maybe uh, is worth mentioning was Notre Dame over Alabama. Simply the way Alabama finished the season, uh, Nate Oates had a really good squad, a team that, that beat Gonzaga and Houston early in the year. To finish the way they finished, uh, probably my most disappointing team maybe in the country this year, based upon where they were and where they were at their best. Uh to be knocked out by a Notre Dame team and, and, and the ease at which Notre Dame beat Alabama uh, was something that I think would have been hard to predict uh, going back uh, late December, early January. Yeah, that's another one as well. And I forgot about that. Notre Dame, of course, almost won the next round, but ended up losing. I think it was to Texas Tech, I want to say. So um, we'll see what happens for the rest of the tournament. But again, thanks for coming on, Matt. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we end the show? No, I think it's just uh, enjoy the rest of the tournament. Here we are, uh, Sweet 16 in a couple days. Good matchups. Uh, we didn't talk about an Arkansas team that, that's capable of winning games. The one team that I will throw out there, as much as I still think Gonzaga is the team to beat, the team I'm keeping an eye on is Texas Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they can no they knock out Duke here on uh, Thursday or Friday. I think it's Thursday. And then uh, I think they can give Gonzaga a game, but – the offense has to find a way to score points, which is always a concern with, with Texas Tech. But it's going to be an exciting uh, week and a half uh, here uh, before the nuts, Nets are cut down on Championship Monday. All right. Again, thanks for coming on. Matt Eisenberg from RushTheCourt.net. Again, all the links will be down in the description below. All right. Thanks for coming on, Matt. And again, enjoy the rest of the tournament. Thank you.